Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Today is Wednesday, September 13, 2017. My name is Dan Gorodnik, and I have the privilege of co-chairing this hearing along with fellow chairs, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal uh, in the Committee of Contracts and Councilmember Robert Cornegie of the Committee on Small Business. I'd like to thank the members and staff from all three committees for joining us for today's hearing, and I would also like to thank the public advocate, Letitia James, and council members, Cornegie, Crowley, and Rosenthal for sponsoring the legislation that are before uh, these committees today. Today's hearing provides all three committees with an opportunity to review critical pieces of legislation that will expand transparency regarding the construction industry's participation in the city's minority and women-owned business initiatives. The bills before the Economic Development Committee are Introduction 705A, sponsored by Council Member Elizabeth Crowley, which would require construction contractors to disclose the race and gender of executive level staff, and Introduction 1400, sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, which would reduce the project cost threshold at which construction contractors are required to make a good faith effort to contract with minority and women owned business enterprises. We look forward to hearing testimony from the administration and the advocates today on these bills, as well as related legislation in the committees on contracts and small business. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my committee staff, uh, Legislative Counsel Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson, Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali, and my Legislative Director Leah Reese. Uh, before turning over the floor to my co-chair Helen Rosenthal, I want to note that we have been joined uh, by Council Members Deutsch, Cornegie, Perkins, Richards, Koo, Rosenthal, and the public advocate, Tish James. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to the Chair of the Contracts Committee, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Gronick. I'd just like to mention that Council Member Borelli is here and Council Member Vallone. My name is Helen Rosenthal. I'm Chair of the Contracts Committee. Uh, I'd also like to thank our co-chair, council members, Cornegie, chair of the Committee on Small Business, and the members of all three committees for coming together to hold this hearing. The bills that we're hearing today supplement our ongoing efforts to improve transparency in city contracting, particularly with regard to the many minority and women-owned businesses that wish to do business with the city of New York. I sponsored Introduction 1400 to ensure that construction contractors participating in the city's industrial and commercial abatement program at least access the city's minority and women-owned business directory for contracts valued below $750,000. For larger contracts, Intro 1400 requires these construction contractors to solicit bids from at least three subcontractors who are certified MWBE. By reducing the threshold for MWBEs to participate in city procurement, Intro 1400 empowers the city's many certified MWBEs and gives them an opportunity to thrive. Before the Contracts Committee today is Intro 752B, sponsored by public advocate Letitia James. This bill would expand disclosure requirements for construction contractors on projects of $1 million or more. Intro 752B would require construction contractors to disclose demographic and job-related information about each employee working for those contractors. This information would be used to evaluate the effectiveness of the city's many MWBE and workforce development initiatives and establish a benchmark for the construction industry's efforts to increase representation of the communities that have been historically underrepresented in the sector. So many leaders in the construction industry have committed themselves to expanding the opportunity to pursue these middle class careers to those who have been left out historically. And I'm proud to co-sponsor this bill because I believe we need better tools to measure the progress that has been made 
uh, to help the city more effectively make policy to assist in those efforts. I look forward to hearing the testimony today as we work to craft a bill that will give us the data we need to keep pushing forward without unduly burdening the firms doing the city's work. Um, I'd like to thank the Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, and Finance Analyst John Russell, as well as my Legislative Director Sean Fitzpatrick for all their hard work preparing for this hearing. Be before turning the floor over to the Public Advocate to discuss her bill, I'll now turn the floor over to Chair Carnegie to say a, a few words. Thank you. Thank you, co-chairs. Um, I would just like to start by saying uh, my absence of a jacket and tie uh, is not a function of or a testament to not thinking this hearing is important. It's a function of a lunchtime accident. And the, <laughs> and the inability to have a big and tall located very close by <laughs> City Hall. So good afternoon. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Small Business. I'd like to thank Chair Helen Rosenthal of the Committee on Contracts and Chair Dan Gorodnik of the Committee on Economic Development for holding this hearing jointly with us and all of you attending our hearing today. According to the New York City Building Cong Congress, 2016 marked the fifth consecutive year of rising employment in the construction industry, which is the first time that has been the case since 1970. Employment has increased from 1,200, from 122,013 to 146,000 in 2016. Additionally, annual construction wages increased by 5.4% in 2016, the highest annual percentage increase since 20, 2007, when wages increased by 6.4%. These jobs pay well and can serve as ladders to the middle class for individuals and families across the five boroughs. However, the demographics of the construction industry currently do not reflect those of the city. Minorities are underrepresented in both the union and non-union sectors. A 2017 study released by the Economic Policy Institute found that black workers account for 21.2 percent of unionized construction workers and 15.8 percent of non-union construction workers, even though African Americans comprise more than 25 percent of the city's population as a whole. Today, we'll be hearing and I'll be focusing on intro 1382A, which would amend the administrative code to require contracts employed on city-funded construction projects to provide the Department of Small Business Services with statistics pertaining to the makeup of their workforce. This would include, among other pieces of information, titles, full or part-time designations, hours worked, gender, and ethnicity. In conjunction with the legislation from the Committees on Economic Development and Contracts, all of which broached the same underlying issues, this bill would shed light on an area of the city's econ economy that had received too little attention for far too long. It's my hope that all of these proposals can be developed and improved to ensure the New York City's construction industry remains both viable and equitable for many years to come. I'd like to thank my committee staff, Council Sylvester Ivana, Policy Analyst Michael Kurtz, final Finance Analyst Alia Ali, my Chief of Staff Charles Nwuche, my Director of Policy and Communications Keegan Sheehan, and my Director of Legislation Affairs, Legislative Affairs and Budget Sarissa Phillips Singletary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Carnegie. We'll now go to the Public Advocate, Letitia James. I want to thank uh, Chairs Carnegie, Rosenthal, and Garodnik. And before I begin with my statement, let me just thank, congratulate everyone for yesterday's um, outcomes. I also want to thank uh, the staff of all of the chairs and uh, for putting today's hearing on together on these critically important bills. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the advocates who are in the audience, particularly Bertha Lewis and um, Hazel Dukes for their tireless efforts to bring us to this point. In recent years under this mayor and this council, our city has made great strides towards enacting policies that will fin finally lift up the shameful track record of um, WMBE participation in city contracts. And as a progressive city, we should use our power of the purse and our power as elected officials to encourage diversity. Because we know that when we lift up women, when we lift up people of color, when we lift up immigrants and working families, we lift up entire communities as well as the overall economy. Because the data is in and the facts are clear. Diverse companies are better companies. They're more profitable companies and they're companies that carry less risk. In fact, in a 2015 McKinsey study found that Racially diverse companies outperform industry norms by 35 percent. And according to an even more recent study, companies with 30 percent or more female executives 
bring in as much as six percentage points more in profits. Diverse companies also have better retention rates and more productive employees, and they enjoy stronger work worker recruitment and face significantly fewer internal lawsuits for discrimination in health and safety claims. This legislative package we consider today will help ensure that in the critically important sphere of major development, we are working with the most diverse and thus the best developers and contractors. All New Yorkers have the right to know where their taxpayers, taxpaying dollars are going, and government has a responsibility to ensure that this money is spent transparently and effectively. And I'm grateful to this administration for their willingness to work with us on this critically important legislation. I understand that the administration has some concerns over the level of specificity of the required data and the potential for an invasion of privacy. And while I do not agree that the disclosure requirements would truly deter companies from bidding for city contracts, I do believe that there is the potential for legitimate personal privacy concerns from employees, particularly in smaller companies where there are, uh, where there are, are only so many uh, individuals with a specific job title. I'm therefore more than willing to work towards a compromise that will help alleviate any privacy concerns as long as it does not undermine the core purpose of this legislation. Uh, that being said, I look forward to working with the administration, putting our heads together and fashioning a compromise. And I thank this, uh, the committees and all the chair members uh, for allowing me to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Public Advocate. And uh, before, we, before we begin, I want to give uh, Councilmember Menchaca uh, an opportunity to say a couple words, and then uh, we are going to go right to uh, the panel, which will include um, uh, Shin Mitsugi um, from EDC, Deputy Commissioner Merrill uh, Block Weissman of HPD, Theodore Ober Oberman of uh, Department of Finance, uh, Janelle Doris of the MOMWBE, and Commissioner Greg Bishop of the Department of Small Business Services. Uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the chairs. I, I only just want to say one thing. There's a really core thread in all these pieces of legislation about transparency. I know the city continues to move in that direction. The things that we're asking for will continue to allow us to serve our communities that are not only diverse, but really have different kinds of impacts and different kinds of ways to, um, to engage. This, these pieces of legislation are important for that, but I'm really excited about the discussion that's going to be happening today um, and also listening to the advocates that are going to want to tell you a little bit more about how they think about this and how it's going to actually impact their, their work on the ground, uh, be it gender, race, et cetera. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Members Constantinidis, Men uh, well, you know Menchaca because you just heard from him, Council Member Eugene Ulrich and Kozlowitz. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, now we will turn to the panel uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairs Rosenthal, Cornegie, Grodnick, and our public advocate, James, members of the City Council's committees uh, on contracts, small business, and economic development. My name is John L. Doris, and I am the Senior Advisor and Director of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs. And today I will be testifying on Intro 1400. Also with me is uh, Commissioner Greg Bishop from SBS and my colleagues from DOF, EDC, and HPD. On September 28, 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the establishment of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs as a crucial and much needed next step in the administration's efforts to drastically increase opportunities for minority and women entrepreneurs. The mayor and the citywide MWB director Deputy Mayor Richard Bury pledged ambitious goals of achieving 9,000 certified MWBEs by the end of 2019 and 30% MWBE utilization by the end of fiscal year 2021. To date, SBS has certified 5,122 uh, MWBEs. Additionally, at the end of Q3 of the fiscal year 2017, MOX reported the MWB utilization at 19% representing uh, eight, 847 million in awards to MWBEs as compared to 14% or 696 million in city contracts to MWBEs under Local Law 1 in uh, 2016. The complete fiscal year 2017 numbers uh, will be released shortly at the end of this current quarter. 
The city's MWBE program is intended to remedy the impact of discrimination in the market where the city makes its procurements and to address the findings of disparity. Disparity studies demonstrating the minority and women-owned firms are underutilized in the city's procurements. To that effect, Local Law 1 of 2013 established citywide contracting goals, which match the disparity gaps revealed by the most recently completed disparity study at the time from 2011. Currently, Local Law 1 only reflects, uh, relates sorry, to city procurements. The city has also implemented a number of creative initiatives to help MWBEs build capacity and obtain capital, and has, and has advocated for state legislation uh, to give us more tools for the MWBE program. The mayor has also established the 1NYC goal to award $16 billion to MWBEs by fiscal year 2025. This goal covers both mayoral and non-mayoral agencies. Currently, we are ahead of schedule, and we have awarded, as of Q3 of uh, last fiscal year, over $5 billion in contracts to MWBEs. In addition to the importance of remedying the effects of discrimination on our procurements, expanding opportunities for MWBEs is important to this administration's effort to fight income inequality. Pursuant to Local Law 1, the goals therein, the percentage of dollars awarded to MWBEs subject to the city's program, has trended upward from 8% in 2015 to 14% uh, in fiscal year 2016. Just to put that into perspective, at the close of 2016, fiscal year 2016, we were about halfway to our 30% goal, which we know we can achieve by 2021. We are lowering and uh, lowering, we are lowering, sorry, and wherever possible, removing structural barriers to entry uh, the city's procurement uh, marketplace by providing resources for increased programming and accountability at city agencies and creating strategic initiatives to increase MWBE's ability to compete successfully. We have implemented initiatives to address issues that MWBEs face in the private marketplace, namely access to capital, which is a common obstacle for many uh, MWBEs and small and mid-sized firms. In order to respond to this need, the administration launched the Contract Finance and Loan Fund and the Bond Collateral Assistance Fund, both administered by SBS, and the Emerging Developer Fund, which is administered by EDC. Together, the, the initial investment from the administration across these funds was $30 million. As you may know, the mayor also convened the city's depository banks to begin a discussion about a partnership to create uh, accessible capital for MWBEs in New York City. These discussions are ongoing. In the spring of 2017, we were joined by many MWBEs, advocates, and stakeholders, including other city agencies, to call for state legislative reform that would drastically improve the success of MWBEs in the city contracting process. Uh, S6513, A8505, a bill that uh, proposes increasing the city's discretionary spending limit on goods and services um, purchased from MWBEs and codifies that the city, as well as the state, may offer MWBEs a price or point preference in procurement. The bill passed overwhelmingly in the Assembly and unanimously in the Senate. And for that, we thank our elected partners, including the council members here today and our public advocate for their support and advocacy. On ICAP, New York City operates more than a dozen commercial tax incentive programs, costing nearly a billion per year. It is important to note that these incentives are state authorized and as of right. Moving into the second year of our office, the Mayor's Office of MWBE, we are currently assessing ways to target policy goals like MWBE participation, capital investment across the city, and the NYC workforce. Along with the administration's commitment to leverage, leveraging city's financial assistance to hold developers accountable, SBS has taken steps to ensure MWBs are aware of and have access to the opportunities created from ICAP projects. Outreach has been a major focus of SBS and this program is no different. I'd like to highlight some of the work we've done to increase the visibility of ICAP contracting opportunities for MWBEs. Previously, these opportunities were listed in an unsearchable PDF on a web page that was not accessible. 
understanding the barriers that already existed for MWBEs looking for contracting opportunities. We have updated the SBS website to highlight private contracting opportunities and make them uh, visible to, I'm sorry, on the homepage. Opportunities will no longer be posted as PDF, but rather as searchable, uh, in a searchable uh, database. We have also increased outreach through social media and direct email marketing to ensure that MWBs are not left out or left in the dark about potential contracting opportunities. Though more needs to be done, we believe these small steps will greatly help connect MWBEs to contracting opportunities created through the city investment. Expanding opportunities to women and minorities in, is a priority uh, of this administration's efforts to fight income inequality. Intro 1400 is another step in this direction. We support the goal of Intro 1400, which, as we understand it, seeks to increase the number of ICAP beneficiaries who will be required to engage with the and solicit uh, MWBE uh, participation. Again, we thank uh, the committee members for your attention to the support of the MWBEs. I would like now to turn to Greg Bishop, the Commissioner of Small Business Services. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Rosenthal, Grodnick, Carnegie, and Public Advocate Tish James, and the members of the Committees on Contracts, Economic Development, and Small Business. My name is Greg Bishop, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting New Yorkers to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering vibrant neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I'm pleased to testify in intro 7552B, 1382A, and 705A, and, rep and reporting of workforce data. Insurance city contractors have a workforce that reflects the diversity and the talent pool of the city is an important mission of SBS and the administration. Through our construction industry partnership and the Mayor's Committee on Construction, SBS is working with industry, organized labor, nonprofits, training providers, and workforce organizations to build a pipeline of local talent to fill New York City jobs. The committee is tasked with understanding the barriers to diversity and, ex and access to opportunities for underrepresented groups in the trades such as NYCHA residents, women, minorities, veteran, employees of MWBEs, and young people in public schools. In addition, the city, the Building Trades em Employers Association, and the Building and Construction Trades Council are committed to increasing diversity in the trades through the memor Memorandum of Understanding. The MOU sets a target goal for the construction trades of 55% of all new apprenticeship slots for underrepresented groups. As part of our efforts to connect New Yorkers to quality jobs, SBS will administer the Mayor's Green Job Corps program in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Climate Policy. This three-year initiative aims to train 3,000 individuals through a variety of trainings, including pre-apprenticeship. We are partnering with groups such as BCTC, Construction Skills, Net, the Non-Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW, and Hell Mr. Hard Hats to offer these pre-apprenticeship, which are direct entry construction programs recognized by the trades. We are recruiting for these programs through our Workforce One Career Centers. In October 2012, Mayor de Blasio announced Hire NYC, Hire NYC, a targeted hiring program that places New Yorkers at the front of the line for jobs created by city contracts and investments. Through the SBS-operated Hire NYC portal, vendors who receive new city contract awards are now required to consider New Yorkers for employment opportunities created through eligible city contracts. Hire NYC leverages SBS network of 20 Workforce One career centers to connect New Yorkers to open positions created through the city's purchases and investments. SBS recently launched our mobile outreach unit, uh, boosting our support to uh, uh, boosting our support. Uh, by bringing our services not just to each borough, but directly to business owners, community-based organizations, and job seekers in their own neighborhoods. The mobile outreach unit will bring access to employment opp opportunities through high NYC directly into communities where Workforce One staff will be able to screen local job candidates near the sites of city projects, increasing community access to these jobs. Last year, SBS network of providers and our Workforce One centers connected nearly 30,000 New Yorkers to employment. I will now turn to the legislation at hand. To begin, I would like to provide an update from our hearing in January on Intro 1382 and the Division of Labor Services. 
SBS Division of Labor Services monitors contract compliance with equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity laws and supports them in their efforts to increase the representation of minorities and women in their workforce. DLS reviews construction contracts in excess of one million and subcontracts sub in excess of 750,000. For supply and services, prime and subcontracts over 100,000 are subject to review when the vendor has more than 50 employees. SBS meets with contractors and works with them to ensure they understand the equal employment requirements of city contracts and to evaluate their compliance. This allows us to directly engage with contractors on their hiring practices and at times results in contractors making changes to their own EEO policies. When SBS last came before you on the subject, we heard you loud and clear, both from the council members and stakeholders, that the capacity to track and aggregate workforce data should be a priority in our work. Since that hearing, we took steps to better understand the technological restraints to data reporting and, and assess solutions. We are happy to share that we have we are developing a plan to better track data on city construction projects. To begin, SBS is now accepting projected workforce data and EEO documentation electronically uh, for contracts subject to DL's review prior to the start of city construction projects. The city is also in the process of reviewing technological solutions to help track workforce data. This will empower agencies to request workforce data directly from contractors and subcontractors once the project has begun. However, since this involves many stakeholders, it will likely involve several phases to ensure it is effectively and efficiently rolled out across the city. Once in place, SBS will work with businesses to create an efficient process that allows vendors to easily provide the necessary data. We share the Council's goal of tracking and aggregating data uh, relating to the workforce of city-funded projects. Intros 1382A and 752B would require disclosing and reporting on certain information regarding employment details and MW certification. Through our interpretation of the bill, only though, I'm sorry, though our interpretation of, of the bill only includes development contracts and projects receiving financial assistance from the city, we understand the council's intention is also to include certain city contracts. Transparency is always a laudable goal, and we would like to work with the Council to better define the intended scope of this legislation. The City already tracks some of the data required by these bills pursuant to existing City contract requirements, and the technological solution may enable us to track much of this information electronically. We are happy to work with the Council to discuss these reporting requirements as we move forward with a solution. The Administration supports the intent of the bills, and we would like to work with Council to ensure a responsible scope and implementation timeline. I want to be clear that this process will take some time because changes must be rolled out to the agencies in phases. Implementation will also be resource heavy and once in place, agencies and contractors alike will need time to acquire more advanced administrative systems, learn new procedures, and gather newly required data. Should this bill move forward, we would need to work closely with businesses to provide clear guidelines on the new process and data required which could be especially resource intensive and difficult for small businesses. The legislation also creates new penalties for contractors that do not disclose their workforce data, but currently there's no enforcement mechanism and SBS is not a regulatory agency. Finally, we recognize the importance of reporting workforce data. However, the administration has significant concerns of protecting the privacy of the individuals working on these projects and respecting city's contractors' interests in the confidentiality of proprietary information they're required to disclose in order to be awarded a contract. We would like to discuss amendments to the bill that would create safeguards for the personal information of employees and to avoid a conflict with the requirements of the general municipal law. Intro 705A would require contractors employed to work on, on projects receiving financial assistance from the city to disclose certain information regarding the race and gender of directors, officers, and other executive level staff. While we appreciate the intent of this bill to increase diversity and leadership, we have concerns with the legislation as drafted. Collecting data on race and gender of executive level staff or city contracts may discourage some businesses from competing for contracts with, city, with the city. As with the other bills, we also have significant concerns about protecting the privacy of these individuals. As a reminder, SBS is also mandated by Council to produce a report that analyzes the racial, ethnic, and gender diversity among directors, offices, and executive level staff of certain city contractors. 
We would recommend waiting for the full report to consider whether this legislation is necessary. SBS and administration stand with the council and advocates to ensure transparency of the workforce and city funded projects. We are committed to working with the council to develop the best strategy that achieves this goal in a smart, holistic way. We are not happy to take questions from the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, are going to go uh, first to Council Member Chair Cornegie for questions, uh, and then to Chair Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Garodnik. Um, so I said I was going to keep um, my focus on a particular bill, and I'm going to do that 1382A. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. First of all, good afternoon. So what's the current number of contracts that perform, contractors that perform construction work for the city as of August 2017? Um, is, is it on? Sorry. Good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council Member. We have uh, about at 6,412 6, contracts um, that were performed in construction. So do you know how many individuals are employed by those particular, con that, those 6,000 contractors? So I think I, I, I'll take that question. Um, w when a contract is registered, which is uh, the number that we have, uh, as you know, the, the life cycle of a contract um, we may not have the exact number because at any given point, um, the contractors will have to sort of staff up. Um, so for that particular information, uh, we do not have that information. So, so let me just be, let me be clear. I'm, I'm, this is not a get, these aren't get you questions. I just want to lead up to my belief in the necessity for the bill. So these are questions that are germane to that. Um, can you specify the five largest contracts by dollar amount that the city awarded last year. The name of the firm, I won't ask for the name, but can you just give me the, the five largest contracts uh, by dollar amount for last year? We have uh, the five largest contracts, um, CAC Industries, uh, Tully Construction, IEC Associates, DeFazio Industries, ESOL Contracting, ES2 Enterprises. Thank you. And the number, though, the, by, by dollar amount? We do have uh, total, uh, total awards to those firms. Is that, is that okay? Was that but now, if you have you? to aggregate it, I'll take it by now. I would like a breakdown so we can determine who really, like, we're trying to follow the money trail a little bit. But if, if you only have the, the dollar amount now, at a later date, I'd like to get the breakdown between the five largest. But if you only have the overall number, I'll accept it now. No, we, I mean, we have, we have the total number of contracts given, awarded to those particular industry, those uh, contractors. So it's, for CAC Industries, it was $271 million. Tully Construction, $194 million total in contracts. EIC Associates, Inc., $109 million in contracts. DeFazio Industries, $96 million in contracts. El Sol Contracting, ES2 Enterprises, $94 million in total contracts. Which contractor employs the largest percentage of unionized labor out of the five that you just mentioned? I, I don't think we have, no. I don't think we have that information. Okay, so at, at some point, I think that would be germane to this conversation. So at a later date, I could get that, uh, and this uh, panel could get that, I would appreciate it. Um, what's the gender breakdown of the workforce of those five contractors? So I can give you, um, in terms of the information that I have for uh, they may not be, this may not be an apple-to-apple -apple, um, comparison. So uh, for the 
contracts that were registered with the LS last um, in July, uh, in terms of the breakdown, uh, if you're looking at the, we have a total projected workforce of 351 individuals, um, of which over a, a little bit over half are either minority or women. I'm sorry? So of the 351, over half, uh, a little bit over half are either minority, uh, so that's either black, Hispanic, Asian, um, or women in the total workforce number. Right, so I, I guess I was a little bit more concerned with the top five dollar amount awardees and their breakdown mm -hmm. for this conversation. So do you not have that? So the gender breakdown for the top five that you articulated uh, received the highest amount of awards individually. Do we not have the gender breakdown for them? We could get back to you with that, okay. with the top five. Okay, so I, I don't want to uh, uh, beat any kind of horse, actually. So I'm going to move on from that, but I think that um, that's kind of the, the line of questioning that demonstrates the necessity uh, for, for the bill. So I'm just going to go on to, um, I, did I understand you to articulate in your testimony um, that you do not believe disclosing information on race and gender I mean, I'm sorry, did you do believe disclosing information on race and gender would discourage businesses from contracting with the city? Yes. So the, there's, there's a couple things. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, first of all, we, we do support the intent of the bill, and we do understand the, the, the goals. I think what we want to make sure that there's no unintended consequences, uh, which is why we would love to work with, you know, council to make sure that we understand the scope of the bill, uh, so therefore we can make a determination. Uh, certainly, there are companies, um, and especially smaller businesses, uh, that would end up having an additional burden to provide that particular information, um, depending on what the scope of the bill is. So uh, once we get an understanding of the scope, then I think we can um, you know, uh, work with you to make sure that we do not have any unintended consequences. So as you can imagine, that particular um, ideal would, would, be would be troubling to myself as the chair of small business and probably everyone else who's, who's chairing committees today. If that were the case, that somehow it would be discouraging to disclose that information would certainly be a little bit disturbing. But I think, you know, one of the things we also, you know. That information in particular, I understand um, trying to avoid any un unintended consequences. I, right. I definitely understand that. But we, obviously we believe that that information is germane to a whole series of other um, issues that we may be facing as it relates to um, equity uh, and balance. So sure. that, that if, if somebody was discouraged from doing business with the city based on having to disclose information around, around the demographics of their, of their workforce, that would clearly you know, be, be very disturbing to me. But I understand the, um, the, the necessity to try to negate unintended consequences, but I don't see where an unintended consequence would lie in that particular information. Um, so I don't but, want to monopolize uh, the time, and I know that there are people who, who would like to testify today who have to leave. So I will come back on the second round uh, and ask any questions, but I'm going to stay particularly with this particular bill uh, because of its importance to my committee. Thank you, Chair Carnegie. We'll go to Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, I actually want to just spend a minute making sure I understand how the current sy system works. And um, so I'd like to start there and just make sure that uh, the bill is doing what we want it to do. So help me out here. Um, currently, the, um, sorry, the way it works is a contractor gets chosen and then there's a possibility of them get accessing ICAP funds. Is that a fair statement? I will, oh, oh I'm sorry, I was looking for uh, our, our colleague from the OF can, can outline yes. the process, yes. Um, so I don't know how detailed you want, but um, ICAP is, of course, an incentive program. So in order to potentially access benefits from it, you must first apply to the program. So any applicant would submit what's called the preliminary application. That needs to be submitted prior to 
pulling any DOB permits or starting construction. And then from that point, depending on the size of the, the total project value, um, there are potential MWB requirements under, currently under 750,000 have no requirements. 750,000 to 1.5 million require um, what are called outreach activities. Um, and then over 1.5 million requires a solicitation of three bids from MWBE yeah. firms. I guess wait, wait, I'm sorry, if you could just state your name for the record. I'm sorry, Theodore Oberman from the Department of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Oberman. If you could go even one step prior. So an example might be Department of Transportation wants to contract out for, I don't know, fixing a road. Right, like can you walk through an exact example for me and how it works? Well, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be eligible for ICAP, right, but so, so an, I, what would? an ICAP project, if you, you could have two examples, one would be a renovation of an existing building um, and the other would be the construction of a new building. Um, if you take and it's the, a building that the city wants. So the city no, puts it out. It has of it. nothing no. to do okay. with the city. This is a, this is all private. It's an as of right construction program, which the primary purpose of it is to keep your building taxes in line with what they were prior to when you did the work. Meaning that if you construct a new building, the the goal of the program, as it's legislated, is to keep your building taxes what they were prior to construction. Meaning so that your you assessment would, doesn't go up. Your assessment goes up, but you abate the taxes afterwards. Right, and, and why does the city do it on these types of programs? Why does the city want them to get that benefit? What, what types there's, of buildings are we talking about? It's, it's whatever, whatever falls into the ICAP um, statute, so that would be that would be commercial, retail, industrial. It, there's no prohibition on ICAP except for residential. Okay, why are but, we but giving the tax break? Sorry, uh, to, just to jump in really quickly. It's really to, to, to keep the city modern. Uh, obviously okay. we want to encourage uh, our building stock to uh, be as advanced as possible um, and to compete with other cities. Uh, so this program is really to help keep New York City as a competitive city uh, to ensure that the commercial buildings are as uh, updated as possible. And so we're giving the tax break, even we, the state, is doing this even before thinking about MWBEs. So having an MWBE criteria, is that part of the criteria of doing their work? Well, again, it, um, the MWB requirement for projects over, currently for projects over 1.5 million is the solicitation of three bids. It doesn't But it's only solicitation. Right. It's, it's not, not that the they awarding. use it. Okay. Is the problem, it's only solicitation. So why not change it to use? I think that's why we're in support. Um, okay. Because uh, certainly there's, uh, opportunity outside of our normal procurement world. This is not the MWB program. Right. Obviously, we have, and you are very familiar with the fact that we're doing everything possible to get uh, our city dollars to MWBEs. This is work that's happening outside of that, that we think we can open up more opportunities for MWBEs. And of course, you know, the mayor has been very focused on figuring out every possible way to increase opportunities for MWBEs. Okay. And so it's interesting even that you replied, Commissioner, so in a way it's shifting it from a DOF um, oversight to a SBS Well, we work or? closely with DOF. Uh, obviously, it, when, when Ted alluded to the fact of solicitation, we have to verify that the companies that they have told DOF they solicited are actually certified firms. Uh, but we also, and uh, Janelle mentioned in his testimony, uh, we also want to bring more transparency to the developers and projects that are out there that have this ICAP requirements. Uh, so prior to, um, uh, actually prior to last week, we actually had our information on a, on a spreadsheet 
which wasn't necessarily usable. Right. Uh, we've been able to actually upgrade our website, uh, so that way it's front and center on the home page. Individuals can now go through a searchable uh, Excel sheet. And, and certainly we want to make sure we continue to figure out ways to uh, highlight those particular opportunities for MWBs. And so are you implying that you also want to address the issue of the general contractor might solicit a group of MWBEs that perhaps wouldn't want to bid, and now you're giving an opportunity for MWBE companies to bid without solicitation. So Right. So we want to make sure uh, we do everything possible to maximize the opportunities for MWBs to actually work on these particular jobs. Yeah. Uh, so in the past, we've also, uh, for some of the projects, um, and a lot of these uh, developers actually, they, you know, th there is the intent and, and goodwill to actually use MWBs. Uh, so they've partnered with us to actually have specific events where they tell us the trades that they're looking for that they anticipate yeah. they'll be using. Uh, we invite the MWBs in those trades to meet the developers uh, and basically make that, uh, that connection. And all these sort of efforts obviously uh, would count as uh, a good faith effort uh, as the, the, the rules are written, uh, but we think we can do more, obviously, uh, to increase opportunities there, which is why we're, we're in support. Okay. So, no, I just wanted to add that um, right now we are, as I mentioned in my testimony, we are assessing, looking at ICAP as well as other areas, as you know, um, in our program. And one of the things that we just want to highlight, just as we went up to Albany to get legislation changed uh, for, for the uh, increase in the discretionary spend for MWBs and add in best value, et cetera, we are at the end of this assessment uh, we will have action items and, and things that we would like to see uh, in a program such as ICAP. But th we do caution also that there's a possibility, a strong one, because this is a state as of right program, yeah. that we will have to go back again and get further uh, legislation uh, from the state and authority to do certain things as it pertains to this program. As a first blush, how much uh, or where's the baseline now and how much do you, could you hope it would improve. Yeah, so I will have uh, DOF can talk a little bit about how they captured the data. So uh, unfortunately, currently, it's um, there's no real mechanism which would allow us to tell how many dollars are spent on MWBE firms um, in the ICAP program. And this is for two main reasons. One is um, for projects which are under 1.5 million, they're not required to provide any sort of information about solicitation. That's about 67% of the contracts. That's not, mm. um, so that, uh, I'm sorry, projects rather, not contracts. Um, that's for FY15 to 17. Um, the other is that while they are required to uh, indicate that they've solicited, they're not really required to indicate that they've awarded. So we don't have great information um, about that, um, but uh, it is something that we um, hope to, um, especially with this bill, uh, move to get better data on and, and work more closely um, to, to get that number for the council. Okay, so we, c we don't have a baseline. We don't, I mean, even if you were doing one pint, or 750,000 and above, do we you know? You mean 1.5 million and above? Well. It would be 1.5 million okay. and above, yeah. Do we know for any group um, again, again, how, how much money or how many, anything about the MWBE component? Uh, uh, unf uh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately not. We really don't have a sense. We know when they've solicited the bids, we don't know when they've really awarded the bids. How hard would it be to find out? Um, uh, how many programs are we talking about, or projects are we talking about over between 15, 2015 and 17? Uh, is it five, is it 30, is it 100? It's about 150. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and meanwhile, they've gotten a billion dollars of tax breaks to renovate the city. Well, ICAP's not quite that it's oh, not quite sorry, a billion dollars. Path. It's it's um, it, a billion that's, per year. I think that's for all uh, commercial incentives programs, not just ICAP. ICAP last year was about eighty-eight billion in tax expenditure. Eighty-eight million. I'm sorry, million. <laughs> 
And remember, the, the, the intent of ICAP is it, the ICAP is not an MWB program. ICAP is to increase the commercial stock of the city. We are just, and the reason why we're in favor of this bill, we see this as an opportunity to increase opportunities for MWBEs in this particular area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly, at Councilman, you know, um, in, in, our, in our work, part of uh, what we've been working on is our four core principles. One is accountability, and, you know, if you want to have an effective program or um, uh, initiative to support MWBEs, we want to increase that accountability. Certainly, as we assess the, uh, the ICAP program, which we are currently doing, uh, we will uh, inadvertently come across uh, a whole lot of a uh, host of uh, various um, initiatives that we can help increase the accountability here and so certainly that is as you mentioned is something that we are looking at where uh, contractors um, how they report in what they do and I think that's that's a good area for us to look at and we are looking at that okay so it sounds like SBS has has been doing a bit more recently to um, have more MWBEs participate um, do you have thoughts about uh, what MOCs or SBS would need to do to um, fulfill participa uh, participation goals? It, uh, for ICAP, I, th I think as Janelle said, you know, after the sort of the assessment of the program, uh, I think then once we figure out, you know, where the program is going to go, um, you know, looking at what we've done on the MWB side, I'm sure there's best practices we can uh, utilize to ensure uh, not only solicitation, uh, exactly. but also we see actual um, utilization. Um, so, and certainly happy to work with you uh, to make sure that, you know, there's opportunities there. Okay, and Council you feel room. this bill f fulfills that? I think Just there's. I, I think we we certainly would love to work with you on on, on this. Okay, sorry. No, I just Doris. want to reiterate the fact that you know we support we support the intent yeah, yeah. of the bill and and again in part because I think it, it begins to help us address uh, this particular uh, sector that uh, we are not you know able to navigate or see what's happening there that pertains to MWBEs, but there's more right. opportunities open up. And I think also as you see with the creation even of our office when the mayor's committed really to a, an initiative and get it to get it going resources are are being addressed and, and being allocated to to it so I think once we figure out uh, this program and, and how we can best uh, use the authority given to us by the state to do what we need to do and if we need to go back or make various adjustments or provide different resources to SBS or MOCS as, as we've done when we announced our 30 percent goal this is the similar uh, yeah. approach we would use here terrific well I really appreciate the opportunity to work with you on this legislation and to partner together to make the system work better for the communities that we're all seeking to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Public advocate Tish James. Thank you. Are there any current forms provided to city agencies um, that disclose this personnel information? So um, just to step back in terms of the, the, the process as it is right now, whenever a, a, a contract is awarded um, in terms of in the construction area um, or supply and services, uh, DLS, which is Division of Labor Services, uh, we have to sign off on the EEO um, policy of that company. Um, and the form that we do hand out um, uh, has information um, we collect certain information like health benefits. Um, we collect information um, regarding, um, you know, sort of the names of workers, et cetera. Um, we have trade classifications. We have the hourly rate of pay, union affiliation, um, uh, their address, uh, uh, four, last four digits of the social security number, et cetera. Um, so we do, and that, um, that form uh, is standard across the city. Uh, so any agency that, well, mayoral agency that has uh, to uh, register a contract, uh, that form needs to, be, we have to sign off, DLS has to sign off that that uh, contractor is in line with the city's uh, EEO policy and workforce diversity goals uh, before that contract is registered. 
And the disclosure of race and gender, is that in violation of the human rights law, EEO policy, and or general municipal law? So there is a concern of general municipal law, which is why we would love to work with you uh, to make sure, because we do support the intent. And I, I certainly am passionate about uh, ensuring that uh, the companies that we that you know contract for the city is diverse and reflects the diversity of the city. Uh, we all are, um, uh, but we want to make sure, you know, uh, certainly the privacy of individuals, and to make sure that we do not run afoul of any uh, issues with general municipal law. Uh, but and certainly, would love to work with you and and council uh, uh, to ensure that. Do contractors voluntarily submit um, any personal information, including but not limited to race and gender? So we, we will find out. Uh, I think one of the, the, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, a previous legislation mandated SBS mm -hmm. uh, to actually get that information from uh, the companies that contract with the city, uh, which includes race and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a voluntary, um, you know, so we have, we're working on the survey and we're gonna send it out. I think once we see the results, uh, certainly I think then we can, you know, I think, uh, uh, be better informed on what this legislation should do to ensure that we get maximum participation. Um, is there any concern that given the, the, given the vitriol that we are experiencing from Washington, D.C., um, that there will be one day a requirement that we will report ethnicity um, and or natu national origin? So, I, I th so, I, so I think I, I think where you're headed is is part of our concern in terms of the privacy. Uh, I, I, we just want to make sure, um, you know, certainly New York as a city. Uh, I think contractors, uh, and again, I, I don't want to understate the fact that when we sit down with a contractor, we are telling that contractor they need to be in compliance with New York City's diversity goals for the workforce. Um, and in certain cases, I mean, you know, and based on the, the experience of the team, uh, some contractors actually have avoided contracting with the city because of that. And, that, and, and, list, and you know, to the chairman's point, that is fine. I think, you know, the companies that want to contract with the city, uh, they have agreed and sometimes have asked us to help them. Uh, find workers to make sure that they are in compliance. Uh, we work with you know organizations like I mentioned in my testimony, like New and Helmets to Hard Hard Hats to Helmets, uh, to ensure that there is a pipeline that they those contractors can utilize uh, to make sure that they are in compliance with our diversity goals. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you very much, and uh, I just want to ask a quick. Question or two. You mentioned something about unintended consequences. Sure. Could you be more explicit about those unintended consequences? So, for example, um, you know, when we, we were looking at this uh, at this particular bill, uh, but when a small business is contracting with the city, uh, there's a number of reporting requirements that they have to uh, fulfill. Uh, there's a number of um, uh, or in terms of this, uh, some of the some of the information that we require, they may not be able to get it uh, easily from their payroll system. So they may have to add another module to their payroll system to get some of this information. Uh, so the unintended consequences is just an additional administrative burden uh, on the back office of that particular business. Now, if it's a large corporation, um, you know that that may not be uh, an issue. Uh, but I'm really concerned about the smaller businesses where historically we have seen small businesses struggle with the reporting requirements that the city has. And we have on another side of the, the coin uh, in our Small Business First initiative, been, we've been trying to reduce the regulatory burden that we have on small businesses to make it easier. So that is one of the things I think once we understand the scope of the bill, we'll be able to then talk, make sure that we do not have the unintended consequences. Yeah. I'm concerned about uh, terms like unintended consequences as an excuse for not doing what should be done. And so I'm just trying to figure out how, upon seeing the potential of such an unintended consequence, you're going to manage to overcome that right. and, and nevertheless fulfill the intention of the bill. Because otherwise, it's sort of a diversionary tactic from complying with what the bill is trying to accomplish. Right. I don't mean to suggest that you mean that on purpose, but I just want to be clear 
that you I'm not clear what the unintended consequences are that cannot be overcome in compliance with what we're trying to accomplish. Well, so just to be clear, we are, we are, we support the intent of the bill. So we're not saying that we shouldn't do it. What we're saying is we want to work with you to understand the scope uh, to make sure that there isn't any unintended consequences because what we don't want is a small business having to struggle to actually meet the reporting requirements. And I think, you know, I think once we understand the scope and work with you, we can make sure that that doesn't happen. So I, I think we're saying the same thing, Council Member. I hope so. Um, I, I'm not sure, though. So I just thought maybe you had looked at it and, and sort of listed out some unintended consequences that needed to be overcome. So right, we, put it out there. As, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, the, the, we, we want to understand the scope uh, because I think there's the, the bills have some language that we're not entirely sure if it's going to cover all city contracts, if it's going to cover some of the, so there's, there's some clarity that we would love to work with you to make sure that we understand the scope and then we can make, ensure that there isn't any additional burden on small businesses. You have, an, you have an example of the kind of language that is troublesome? But you, in, in, in terms of the, so, so there is, uh, there is the, the, while we, uh, it could be the bills, the, the bill as is written has, uh, has um, uh, if there's a benefit over a million dollars, I believe, uh, but I think the intent is that it's going to cover all contracts. So those are two different things, because if you're talking, uh, uh, you know, benefit over a million dollars, then more than likely you're talking about a larger business. But if you're talking about all contracts, then you're going to pull in all of the small businesses, including minority and women-owned businesses. So that's why I said we want to make sure that we work with you to understand the scope and the intent, and then make sure that we just mitigate and get ahead of any of the unintended consequences. Again, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm fully, and we are fully in support of the intent of the bill, and we will just want to make sure that we make some uh, we clarify uh, the scope to make sure that we uh, do not have any additional burden on small businesses. So I'm glad to hear that you're fully supportive of the intent, but, it's, but I just want to make sure where you have, we have these unintended consequences that, you, that you're more explicit so that we can what, figure out whether or not. Right. Happy to. It, to, it's, it's, to it's, how much is yeah. compromising the bill? Sometimes that's what happens. I, was, I want to ask a question. Who are the, you mentioned something about the underrepresented groups at some point in your. Yep. Could you, could you identify those groups for me, please? So, I mean, we, when we talk about underrepresented groups, I mean, they, they run the gamut from, anyway, uh, obviously, you know, uh, out of school, out of work youth, um, individuals in, in NYCHA homes. Um, you know, uh, individuals without high school degrees. I mean, there, there's, it, it all depends on, um, you know, what particular category that you're thinking about, but that's well, that women, uh, <clears throat> veterans, I mean, there's, 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 those are just examples. Right. Well, I, 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 you mentioned it, so I just thought maybe you would be more explicit in terms of who we're talking about. So that's that the gamut of the, that, that's the list that you're looking at that's so called underrepresented? Yes. You have a list of, uh, this is just an uh, Right, so I, I, I mentioned some uh -huh. there, yep. Yeah, well, if you have more, I'd like to have more that you look at from that perspective. Okay. All right, thank you. Councilmember Vallone, I'm sorry. Thank you to the chairs. Uh, I, I agree, Commissioner, I thank you for your concerns. I think that's our primary role. I think we're all intent of this, these amendments to the bills. I think as we lower requirements and thresholds, if you're sitting on a small business committee, which is the backbone of our city, we want to implement these things in the best way possible and transition and help our small businesses because the first cry from any district and any council member is our small businesses are struggling and need help. So I, I thank you for looking for unintended consequences and looking for ways to help these smaller businesses entering into a new threshold that haven't been there before to figure out how the best way to implement these great intents. So I, I, I appreciate your you. concerns and efforts on that. Some of them seem pretty simple. Some of them don't. So I'm just thinking um, when you read the comments of the testimony that's been submitted today, uh, some of them come up as, you know, whether notarizing documents or they can submit documents online on working with you to 
to ease into this process and how will these new businesses receive assistance from your department in getting into this new process if and when it comes, which I'm sure it will. Right, and I think, again, going back to, you know, once we understand the, the, the scope and then we understand what's, what's necessary, um, we can then figure out the, the assistance that we'll give the small businesses to make sure that they um, uh, can be in compliance. Um, but I also, um, you know, do not want to uh, sort of leave out the, the privacy part um, because I want to make sure that, um, you know, there is the, the administrative burden on the, on the, on the business, uh, but then there's the workers, right, because we want to make sure that the workers are also protected. So, again, you know, I, I think the first step is working um, with council uh, because we are in, in support of the intent. Uh, to make sure that we address those particular uh, concerns uh, by really focusing on the, on the scope, uh, and then we can then come up with, uh, I think, uh, solutions um, uh, for small businesses. And I think just the last question, because I know you have other panels, is would, when these do get implemented, would they be retroactive or would start from the time of implementation? Uh, I think that's something that we will work with council on to determine. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chairs. Thank you, Council Member. Um, if there's no more questions, we will go to the second panel. Thank you so much, Commissioner, Director, and staff. Thank you. Thank you. So as they leave, I'm going to call the next panel. Ms. Bertha Lewis, Ms. Denise Richardson, Ms. Hazel Dukes, and Mr. Donald Ramsmuir. If the panel's uh, ready, I'd like to begin. Um, I would, uh, if you'll indulge me, I would ask that um, uh, Ms. Hazel Dukes, who had asked to go first, because she has another engagement, if everybody would indulge me, uh, Ms. Hazel Dukes would testify first. It's on now, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to uh, the chairs of the committees and to our public advocate, uh, Mrs. James, and most certainly to the chairman of the contracts, uh, Chairman Carnegie. Uh, my name is Hazel Dukes, and I'm the president of the NAACP New York State Conference with 15 branches across the boroughs. The NAACP is one of the oldest, boldest, most effective, and most respected civil rights organization in the nation. The NACP New York State Conference have played a pivotal role in moving the agenda for freedom and equality forward under the leadership of our presidents within the state conference, each of whom addressed many critical issues daily during their tenure. As you know, diversity and equal employment opportunities are of paramount importance particularly within New York City construction industry, which has historically served as a pathway to economic advancement for minority workers. For over a year, I have personally discussed the need to increase the transparency surrounding construction projects that receive financial assistance of any kind from the city. And let me just say to the council leadership today, I was really 
impressed with the questions that you asked of the members that just uh, left. I hope some are still here. The city inability to access who receive the benefits of city assistant contract projects continue to be unacceptable. And Councilwoman Rosenthal and Public Advocate James, that was very clear in the questions and Councilman Perkins in the questions that you asked today. The public should know whether city residents of all races are actually working the good paying construction jobs receiving city funds. Today I'm pleased to share support for all four of the bills being heard. These bills will help minority and women owned business get more of the opportunities that they deserve. Councilwoman Rosenthal, you was right on it when you asked about the financial. That's what we're looking at, the bottom line. We want to know where our money is going as taxpayers in this city. I commend the city council and its staff for coming to their senses by adopting the majority of provisions included in the City Assistant Construction Workforce Disclosure Act that I submitted in my January testimony on intro 1382. However, now is not the time to rest on your laurels. I urge the council to be even more aggressive and to adopt more of the Disclosure Act language, specifically by requiring covered projects to disclose the union affiliation of their workers, by requiring the designated administrating agent to release data-driven recommendation to improve diversity, and by making these much-needed improvements effective immediately. Furthermore, you all must begin considering the ongoing oversight that will be needed to ensure the requisite data is actually collected this time. Take action to address the city past failures and broken system immediately. City assistant construction project should know that receiving public benefits bring public responsibility. Do not let the Department of Small Business Service real estate developers, contractors, or trade association tell you otherwise, the NACP stand ready to support you in these long overdue efforts. Thank you, Chairman Carnegie, for the hounding that I have given you. Thank you, Public Advocate James, for uh, assisting and meeting with us to discuss this issue, but we cannot stop here today. As I said, we cannot sit on our laurels. We, make, we need to make sure as New York City residents that our taxpayers and our money make sure that everybody is included, regardless of what the trade use unions say, whatever the contractors say, we know best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? No, we're pretty clear. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've been clear for two years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm next. Uh, thank you all for having this hearing. Uh, finally, um, I'm here to testify regarding intro 705A, 752B, 1382A, and 1400. Uh, but let me just say, as some of you who know me, every time I testify on the record, I request one thing. One day, in committee hearings, the public will be allowed to go first before the administration. Thank you very much. Just wanted to make sure that was on the record. So I am here. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here uh, as um, my sister, <laughs> uh, Ms. Duke says, we've been fighting for several of these things. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't single out the Women's Committee and the Women's Caucus for helping to push this forward. And also to the chairs, Rosenthal 
and to Mr. Carnegie, who's an honorary sister, and to our public advocate. For those who don't know me, and you too, I, and as you're, you're the sister of sisters, my name is Bertha Lewis, and I'm an activist, an organizer, and an advocate for fair practices in housing and labor for working people of color. I am the founder and president of the Black Institute, as well as the founder of the Black Leadership Action Coalition, or Black. My entire life's work has revolved around shaping public policy to affect positive, equitable change in minority communities. It is in this capacity that I'm here today to offer my full-throated support for all four bills heard today. And as some of you who know me know, that was uh, unheard of. I rarely ever come to say yay for everything. But employment in New York City's construction trades has historically been a vehicle of economic mobility, a vehicle which also historically has been to the exclusion of people of color. Equal employment opportunity laws are not enough to remedy this injustice or to turn the tide of bigotry against people of color in the construction trades and, I might add, against women. This is why it is imperative that we keep the light shining on projects that receive assistance from the city to make sure that the diversity of this city is truly reflected in the labor force working on these projects. Anything short of this transparency is an insult not only to workers excluded from such projects, but to the public, which is helping to subsidize them. Developers are not entitled to this assistance. It comes with the responsibility to be a part of a community, and that means a diverse community. We also must recognize that transparency alone is only the first step. We have to be aggressive in making sure that diversity is the rule and not the exception on projects that receive any city assistance. We now have the ability to use data to make this a reality, and there's no excuse for why we aren't using these tools today. After all, without data, you cannot make public policy. Without data, you cannot make effective legislation. This is why we need the oversight necessary to guarantee that data is collected properly and impartially. Passing these bills would be a victory for minority and women-owned businesses, of course, that I've advocated for for my entire career. Now, they stand ready to help continue to build this great city, and there's no good reason why at all why they shouldn't be getting their fair share of contracts, especially on city-assisted projects. As committee members, you are the trusted inheritors of a checkered past. And so, it is on your shoulders to help remedy the failures and injustices of our past, to make sure that the developers and businesses which wish to use city assistance for their project understand their responsibility to the people. Over the years, I've had many opportunities to talk to developers, to builders, and I always tell the story about a developer that told me if I could make one penny less than what I could, I consider that a loss. I just follow the rules, miss. I just follow the rules. And so I am thankful today that some of those rules people will have to follow by giving us disclosure. And I, the Black Institute, and Black, we stand ready to support you in any way we can. 
I am proud that this city council passed this legislation. We'll have a new city council in January. And so you all have set the standard and I hope that they can improve on what you so boldly and courageously have done. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. James? Ms. Lewis, you were here when the administration testified, um, and they indicated that currently the form that um, they receive discloses health benefits, name, work, trade, salary, union affiliation, address, and social security, and that is the, it is their position that personal data, which includes gender and race, violates um, general municipal law. What is your position? Um, I totally disagree with that. Um, there's, there's personal, and then there's personal. Everybody can see what my gender is. And if I am on a job, especially on a city assisted job, um, those are pertinent data. The Census Bureau collects that type of data. And so I think that we always, you know, activists like myself always run into this barrier of like, ooh, that's personal, ooh, that's confidential. And so we find ourselves in the dilemma that we are when things are hidden um, behind confidentiality or behind something that is personal. If you are going to apply for public works, public assistance, then the public needs to know basic facts about who you are. Not going into your bedroom, not going into your kitchen, not going into your family. So I think it's a rather specious argument that has held us back for an awfully long time. Do you believe that um, report, disclosing zip codes would achieve the same objective? I believe that the zip codes should be disclosed mm -hmm. because I would like to know uh, where you actually live because we know the zip codes of what the developments are and where the work is being done. So, do you have a zip code from New Jersey? Mm. Or do you have a zip code from East New York? I think that is pertinent data because uh, the government should put out statistics about the workforce, who is working, where they're working, and where they're living, where their primary residences are, where they're registered to vote. So the zip code of the workers would be highly informative. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Denise Richardson, Executive Director of the General Contractors Association of New York. I'd like to start out by tes my testimony by stating that we support intro 1400, and so that is not the subject of my comments today. We do, however, have serious concerns and must oppose, as they are presently written, intros 705, 752, and 1382. Let me be clear, the GCA and our members strongly support workplace diversity efforts and all EEO standards. There are currently 68 different federal, state, and local anti-discrimination, EEO, and pay protection laws, rules, and regulations, all of which we support and abide by. Since 1980, the GCA members, like all construction contractors doing business with the city, have been submitting workforce utilization reports in compliance with Executive Order 50. That's 37 years' worth of information that the city already has in its possession that will provide a more than adequate snapshot of the composition of the construction industry workforce that works on city projects. Based on both the number of existing EEO statutes and the reporting that the industry is already subject to, the GCA must oppose the burdens that will be imposed by 705, 752, and 1382. 
I'd like to also point out that these bills unfairly target construction contractors, impact business competitiveness, and disclose confidential pay information. And interestingly, construction managers, architects, and engineers, and other professional services that are key to delivering the city's capital program and which provide the promotional opportunities as people move up through the ranks of the industry are oddly excluded from these bills as are the multitude of other companies which which the city does business. Based on Mock's own information, actual construction represents only 19% of the city's overall procurement expenditures, yet these bills only look at construction contracts. In FY16, only three of the city's 15 largest contracts, only 7% of the total dollar value represented by these awards were for actual construction, and yet the proposed bills target only this very small piece of the city's overall procurement portfolio. It is ironic that the city now seeks to require employers to collect data about their employees' race, ethnic group, and gender that under laws is a voluntary disclosure. But the data requirements go further, mandating disclosure of total compensation, zip code, date of hire, and pay trends for each worker. This is confidential employee information that the council is asking to be reported quarterly and posted on the city's website. The potential for identity theft is significant, as most most construction projects do not employ hundreds of people in either their executive staff or their workforce. In fact, the average number of executives and senior managers at a construction company is seven and the average workforce is less than 20. A simple cross-matching of information among various websites would easily yield individual information. The city should not be in the position of enabling identity theft. The, closure, the disclosure of this pay information is also contrary to Local Law 67, recently passed by the Council, which prevents prospective employers from inquiring about a worker's salary history. Yet the same information could easily be obtained under this proposed legislation. Please note also that firms bidding against each other for city contracts will be able to use this data to figure out their competitors' approach to work and use that information in their bids. This is not the intent of the city's competitive bidding statutes. Firms will also use this information to poach people from each other as the salary information will easily reveal a business's overall compensation program. Again, this is a city-sponsored intrusion on private business decisions, and it does nothing to ensure that the city's bidding opportunities remain fair, open, and competitive. These bills will make it more difficult for businesses, especially small businesses, to contract with the city. The onerous nature of the reporting will also encourage firms to think twice about whether they want to continue doing business in New York or to focus solely on private work or work in other jurisdictions or for other government entities. Just today, in speaking with one of our members that does business in other states, he reported what a difference it was to work in a state that partners with their contractors to get the projects done on time and on budget with a minimum of paperwork. I would not be surprised if that member made the decision to focus his efforts elsewhere and stop bidding work in New York. The impact, of course, will be on those employees whose personal circumstances would not afford them the opportunity to move with their employer. But apparently, as the city looks to impose more onerous requirements on the businesses that provide private sector middle class jobs, the impact on the individuals is not a consideration. For these reasons, the General Contractors Association opposes 705, 752, and 1382. Thank you. Thank you for the very detailed testimony. Any questions? Um, Public Advocate Tish James. Yeah. Ms. Richardson, um, you mentioned the 68 various federal, state, and local anti-discrimination laws, the EEO standards, pay protection laws, rules, regulations, and the workforce utilization reports in compliance with Executive Order 50. Do any of them require disclosure of race or gender? Not in an, just purely in an aggregate way, not as on an individual basis. And our concern is that this information in the way that it would look to be reported in these bills would go to the individual level. We have no concerns about EO50 and the disclosure requirements in EO50, and in fact, we support them because 
it allows you, if that data were analyzed, to determine which firms are providing pension plans, which firms provide health insurance, which firms have health and safety plans. This is all very important information beyond just pay and workforce composition that tells you is, an, is a business entity a, a good business or a not so good business. We have no issue with the disclosure requirements of Executive Order 50 because it's on an aggregate basis. We're specifically getting to the issue of diversity and we specifically want sunshine and disclosure with regards to race and gender um, on, as it relates to construction projects in the city of New York. Um, we're, it's, it's really critically important to us that when you define good, that good includes a diverse workforce in the city of New York. We too join with the individual that you spoke to, um, spoke about, who wants to make sure that our projects in the New York City are on time and on budget, but we also want to make sure that the workforce is diverse and that all, that all individuals, that all employees, that all individuals in the city of New York have an opportunity to work. That's the focus of, our, um, of these bills here today. And so I look forward to working with the administration as we um, try to um, include some amendments uh, to uh, reflect that objective. And I thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Carnegie, Rosenthal, Public Advocate James, <clears throat> members of the committees. I am Donald Ranchty, Senior Vice President of the Building Trades Employers Association, an organization representing 26 contractor associations and 1,800 union construction managers, general contractors, specialty trade contractors doing business in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to allow us to, test to provide testimony today. First, allow me to say that the BTA has been an advocate for diversity in the construction industry for the, the entire 20 years um, that uh, Mr. Coletti, who is president and CEO of the organization, um, has been at the helm. The organization was a co-founder of Construction Skills, a program that is open to New York City high school students and is a direct pathway into the Building Trades Union Apprenticeship Program. To date, Construction Skills has placed over 1,800 union apprentices of those, 51% are African American and over 35% are Latino. In addition, 85% of them are, remain New York City residents. The BTA is on the board of non-traditional employment for women, furthering the careers of women in construction and also Helmets to Hard Hats, a program designed for returning veterans. These programs were born out of a need to increase diversity in the workforce on the, in, in the construction uh, industry and the, the successes are many. In addition, Mayor de Blasio has appointed um, Mr. Coletti to the MWB Advisory Council. In order to diverse, increase diversity on the management side of the construction industry, the BTA entered into a groundbreaking new partnership with CUNY and NYC Department of Education that will enable high school students to earn their high school diploma and an associate's de degree in construction management, architecture, and civil engineering. The program of study, vocational training, and work experience will make these students the top candidates for jobs in construction management. We are happy to report that after the first two years of our six-year program, the student body is more than 90% African American and Latino, all are New York City residents, with a strong presence from Brooklyn and Queens. The next generation of, construction, of leaders in construction management is on its way. With this said, we do have some concerns regarding the vague nature of some of the content of the bills, and as always, the devil is in the details. For example, in intro 752, it's difficult to ascertain who or what executive level staff means and will the size and shape of corporate entities change in order to, to um, skirt the, the law. I know that when we think of construction companies, we think of large multinational corporations, such as New York-based Tishman, Turner, or Skanska. These companies have EEO officers, recruit diverse members to their staff, and, and often finance diversity training workshops for sm other small companies. But the heart of the construction industry in New York City are the small companies that span two, three, sometimes four generations of a family with only a handful of company employees. According to a joint study conducted by the BTA and the Wharton School of Business, 90% of construction companies employ 25 people or less. I would hate to see a New York City-based, family-owned company punished for, for being family-owned and local. The second problem is when we talk about the executive level, <clears throat> will that extend to the workforce? Those four men and women, four men and women, superintendents, they're not usually employees of the company except for on that one particular job. 
but in our contracting world are sent from the building trades locals. Again, in intro 705, we were asked for diversity statistics on covered contractors. Does that mean the construction manager, general contractor, who are in some cases exempted, but are usually the permit holders? Or does this also apply to secondary subcontractors further down the line to tertiary subs? This is not a knee-jerk reaction against more government relation in the construction industry. Construction is one of the most difficult endeavors uh, to, to get off the ground. Again, in the Wharton report, 90% of companies that were um, surveyed since 1988 had gone bankrupt. There are concepts we support in all of the bills, such as the lowering of monetary thresholds for small businesses, as stated in intro 1400. But if for unfortunately, at this juncture, we need to oppose the bills until we can have conversations that are thoughtful with the bill sponsors to clarify vaguety, vaguities, vaguities, vague notions in the bill, <laughs> and to prevent duplicitous reporting with federal EO1 reports, uh, New York State, and uh, New York City reporting. We look forward to having those discussions with the sponsors and along with each of you. Thank you. Thank you. There are no questions. I believe there's a comment from Ms. Bertha Lewis. We understand um, the sausage making process of legislation. I would respectfully request that as these conversations go on between the legislators and those who are on opposition to these bills as well as the administration, that those of us um, on the other side who have been organizing workers and have been advocating for just the kind of disclosure that these bills represent, that we also be included in those conversations so that when there is a round table, that table is not lopsided, but it is full. And we also think that you should examine very, very scrupulously the language and take into consideration um, all of the things that have been brought up and also check their facts. So we want to be included in those conversations as you move forward. And we're respectfully requesting that. 100%. Yes. yes. Public advocate. Sure, I apologize. I just thought, um, Donald, this um, WMBE Advisory Council, what's the status of it that um, the mayor has convened? Well, it, it's been more than a year. Yes, um, no. I know. That, I know that um, we attended one meeting. Um, we've received some updates, but I, nothing recently. We haven't been convened or called back to any meetings. Um, I know that there was a meeting where uh, contractors weren't asked to come to the table, and that, and that was fine, and we were notified of that, but we haven't been to um, a meeting recently. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may, may I make one more point that wasn't in testimony just quickly? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, we didn't include it in testimony, but we, we have been in, uh, in discussions with MOX. We recently uh, released an MWBE report called Achieving 30%, which we've sent uh, to all council members. And um, when we talked to Mox, the 50% of, fully 50% of all of the MWBE dollars in, in New York City capital projects went to construction. So um, in addition to having discussions about the particulars of these bills, um, we tend to disagree that construction is an area of concern in that respect, but um, we, we'd still love to talk to you all about it. So as you can see that there are varying degrees of uh, understanding of how this goes, and um, I think that there's ongoing dialogue that needs to happen. Uh, Ms. Lewis, I think that no one could appreciate more than you what it took to get us here today, and that was a lot of dialogue and a lot of hard work on behalf of not only the advocates, but the legislature and the trades. So I think we've set a precedent for having those parties present at the table that need to move things forward on behalf. And so I can commit to, for myself and my office and my colleagues to continue in that vein. Thank you. This hearing is officially adjourned. <laughs>